I'm thrilled to be back, as it were, in Orange County. And while I regret that we can't all be face to face, uh, I'm grateful to you, all of you, for making the time to connect. We all care deeply about our country and its future. And that's why I'm here today, today to discuss the threat of religious nationalism in America. So I want to focus my talk today on some of the key organizations that got their start in California, but have had a national impact, starting with one here in Orange County. And then I'm hoping to hear from all of you. But first, you know, I'd like to ping off that image that Rhett just showed on the screen of Trump having his Bible up in front of uh, St. Mark's Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. Let's think for a moment about the fact that a group of peaceful protesters in Washington, D.C.'s Lafayette Square were exercising their First Amendment right, um, and they were attacked by the military with tear gas and rubber bullets so that Trump could walk over from the White House to the church to hold up a Bible. So what did the politics, um, what, did, what did that mov moment say about our politics today? Most American politicians have at some point appealed to religious language and religious We just lost audio. Uh, Catherine's uh, muted. Uh, Catherine, can you unmute? Hi, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, you're good now, yes. Catherine. Sorry. Great. How much did you hear of that? Uh, most of it, just the last few sentences. We got, I think okay, you got muted. So we were talking about Trump's Bible op and the fact that a bunch of peaceful protesters were cleared so that, um, you know, with, with attack with tear gas. And, uh, and rubber bullets so that Trump could make his little triumphant walk and have his little, you know, Bible op with a, uh, in front of the church, or his Bible photo op. So I wanna say, what did that moment say about the politics of today? Most American politicians, as we all know, have at some point used religious language and or used uh, appeal to religious imagery to unite the nation. They've often done so surrounded by representatives of different faith traditions. But Trump didn't do that, did he? He stood alone. The meaning of that moment, as was clear to all, was not unity, but division. It wasn't, you know, this represents us as a, a nation, all of you, in all your beautiful diversity. It was, this represents the people who believe correctly. So he, he wielded the Bible as a weapon, and he aimed it squarely at the Constitution. This is not politics as usual. This is not merely pandering to the base. This is what religious nationalism looks like. Religious, I think the most important part of that, you know, the, the imagery itself was really important, but the, I, I believe the more important part of it was the fact that he was willing to call in the military to come in and squelch his political opponents and his the people who support him would be very happy with that. Tony Perkins praised the move, Franklin Graham praised the move, um, and other religious right leaders, I believe Robert Jeffress said something very positive about it. Um, and that's what religious nationalists do. They often uh, use the military to squelch their political opponents, who they cast as ultimate evil. So religious nationalism is fundamentally incompatible with modern constitutional democracy. It rejects equality. It rejects the idea of a just and pluralistic society that our constitution is meant to uphold. Of course, um, these principles have been applied incredibly imperfectly over time, but they are ideals that we, we should continue to strive for. And they are ideals that um, uh, religious nationalism holds in contempt. Religious nationalism divides the us from the them the supposedly pure from the supposedly impure. And it focuses the grievances of its base on a de demonic or dehumanized others. People keep asking how the religious right can continue to stand behind Trump, a leader with a long history of doing and saying things that no so-called values voter should want to endorse. It's just, uh, uh, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> but in fact, his clear disdain for the rules is part of his appeal to this cohort. Uh, Trump's transparently Im immoral, and I should say amoral character, makes him the ideal leader of a religious nationalist state. He represents the lawlessness of the authoritarian. He puts himself above the law. 
and he's therefore representative of the authoritarian impulses of his supporters. So let's talk for a few of the key, like the movement is very complex. It, it's not like there's not one leader, there's not one organization behind it, like any other very effective movement. It consists of a variety of organizations, uh, different leaders uh, working in different areas that sort of all come together in a common political vision. So I want to talk about a few of the movement's key organizations and intriguing personalities. And I want to start by focusing on one uh, that really has its roots right here in Orange County. I focused a chapter of my book on a fellow from Orange County named Jim Doman. Doman's story is an irresistible one for anyone interested in understanding the movement's structure and aims. He's a pastor who calls himself a former homosexual. It's what he calls himself. And he founded a large statewide network called Church United, which works in their words to quote, help pastors transform California at the government and church level. The goal of Church United is to politicize pastors in the right direction to get them involved in politics and to get them to encourage their congregants to vote the so-called right way. So they, they, they basically are this network of pastors that go all over the state. They started with six affiliated pastors in 2014. Uh, and by now, Church United counts well over 500 pastor members. They host regional briefings, facilitate partnerships with local and state officials, and they take their members on what they call awakening tours of the state capitol in Sacramento, where they um, pastors learn about the legislative, legislative process and um, strategically target committee members to defeat what they call the, quote, enormous evil facing California from the legislature. So it's un unabashedly partisan, um, although they would say it's all about values, but we'll get into that a little bit later. They also, by the way, invite uh, pastors to Washington, D.C. every year, where they meet very important and politically connected movement leaders. So in, in essence, it's like a voter outreach mas machine, in part, you know, that works through pastors. Movement leaders know very well that pastors drive votes. Um, so the aim of this organization is to get these pastors to persuade their congreg congregants to vote their, quote unquote, biblical values. And these biblical values, as we all know, um, always boil down to one or two key issues, because they know very well if you can get people to vote on a single issue, or maybe two issues, you can control their vote. So Jim Doman invited me to attend a Church United event at a Chula Vista megachurch uh, in the San Diego area. Uh, it was for dozens of mainly Latino pastors and their families. There were, I think, several hundred people in the, uh, in, the, in the church pews at the time that this event took place. And a number of leaders, sort of movement leaders, were the speakers and giving some of the pastors were sort of very prominent in uh, one of the Church United subgroups. And they were basically telling all these other pastors who'd been invited how to get out their congregations to vote their so-called biblical values. One speaker told the group, when you're talking with your congregations about these issues, what's more important, talk about the minimum wage or about life? Life, of course, meaning abortion. They know very well, again, if you can get people to vote on a single binary life and death issue, you can control their vote. Um, you know, and if you, they put it that way, you know, what's, what's more important, a few extra dollars or life itself? You know, it's a very leading kind of question. So the reason I'm bringing up Church United now is that what happens at these networking organizations has a measurable effect on local, state, and even national politics. So let's say you're a member of a, a town school board or a city council member. At a typical meeting, you might get a dozen attendees, at least on a good night. All of a sudden, and seemingly out of the blue, hundreds of concerned or even angry citizens with hard right views descend on your meetings to protest, say, a health education program at your kid's school. And you learn of this kind of thing happening at other school boards or city council meetings across the state. And you think, where is this coming from? Where is this opposition to you know, this particular measure coming from? Well, this is often by design. The folks showing up might have been organized by movement leaders for political purposes. This pertains directly to California's Healthy Youth Act. The act took effect in 2016. It uh, includes health and sexuality education. It requires school di districts throughout the state of California 
to provide students with comprehensive sexuality and health education. Um, so back to that Chula Vista megachurch. I'm sitting there and a pastor named Jack Hibbs, I don't know if any of you know him, he pastors in Chino Hills. He has challenged the IRS very directly to look at his tax exempt status because he's very overtly political. I mean, remember the justification for tax exemptions of churches is that they're supposed to stay out of partisan politics. And he gives like very obviously political speeches and sends tape of it to the IRS as, you know, challenge me, you know, wants to get into the fight. So anyway, he's there and he's, you know, affiliated with Church United. He's representing Church United in, in speaking. So he gets up and he tells us the Healthy Youth, Youth Act is, quote, the most radical sex education the state has ever seen. He says, there's not no opt out extended to the family. Your child must go through this curriculum. This is an unvarnished falsehood. First of all, there is no single course on offer in California's Healthy Youth Act. Rather, there are multiple courses and curriculum materials that have been approved. Some of them are used in different districts. Some of them aren't frankly used at all. And furthermore, parents are legally allowed to opt out of uh, sex education uh, curricula and health education, and many parents do. So after Jack Hibbs spoke at this Chula Vista church, we were given a handout of the alleged curricula. And um, I want to make sure I'm not violating a copyright law, so I'm just going to wave it very briefly in front of you. Um, it's a one page sheet that was a lurid mashup of graphics and text. Some of the materials that I saw struck me as age inappropriate, factually incorrect, or even bizarre. And I could really see why they might be concerning to parents. On the back of the sheet, I'm looking like right here, it's a list of um, 77 California politicians, and all but one were Democrats. So it, it really is intended to alarm parents. I'm a parent too, it was alarming to me. And on the other side, you see a whole bunch of Democrats are supporting this, and you're like, oh no, what's going on? So when I later checked with California, I ch several California school district representatives, I was told, um, in, in school districts like uh, San Francisco Unified, I figured if anybody's pretty liberal, it's going to be them, right? So I was later told that none of the graphics or materials on the handout were being used in any district public school in the manners imply in the manner implied by the organizers of this event. And a lot of the materials were not used at all. Uh, some of the materials, for instance, that they suggest are being taught at the kindergarten level are taught at the high school level where they will be developmentally appropriate and some materials were not anywhere taught. Um, but you can see how effectively the leadership of this movement manipulates its population to rile them up and achieve their political aims because then these parents who are members of these congregations are gonna get this and they're gonna get really alarmed and then they're gonna go to their local school board meeting or city council meeting or something like that to complain. So the event in Chula, Vista, in, in Chula Vista, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, it was, it was held in the Spanish language, drew dozens of Latino pastors and their families. Um, and the overwhelming majority of the congregants were at that time uh, Latino in that event I went to. So I wanna talk about that for a moment. Doman's initiative points to something that's really interesting about the racial dynamics of uh, the Christian, the religious nationalist movement, or the Christian nationalist movement, or what some people call the, you know, the Christian right, or the religious right. The movement is frequently characterized as a white movement. And I think in, in large measure that's true for many of the people, uh, white people and the rank and file, it is without a doubt implicitly a white movement. Um, for them, it is surely part of a vision that re involves recovering a nation that was once supposedly both Christian and white, um, furthermore, the movement is driving support for a political party that has made race-based gerrymandering and voter suppression a st strategic um, part of how they operate. That's why they have this advantage. Um, it's an imperative to them to engage in this sort of um, race-based voter suppression. It's really disgusting. And, um, you know, they're also driving support for a political candidate, Trump, who uh, is frankly unapologetic about his own racism and won his election by appealing to the racism of many of his supporters. Um, but leaders of the mo movement, people like Jim Doman or Tony Perkins or Ralph Reed, 
can read the demographic future as clearly as you or I can. Many of them understand very well that if their movement is to survive in the future and if they want to uh, win elections, um, uh, they really need to draw in some number of voters of color. They also recognize that some of the fastest growing varieties of evangelicalism in America are in the charismatic and Pentecostal veins. And these are explicit, explicitly multiracial movements. They're very diverse. Some of them are more conservative leaning than others. But so leaders are also making a conscious effort to include and empower some number of non-white groups and individuals. At least what they're doing is trying to collect their votes. Now, they're much more successful, of course, when they focus their efforts on, uh, in particular, Latino pastors in certain swing districts. Um, and, and that's what, what I saw at the Chula Vista megachurch. Um, Doman's uh, efforts, uh, but that is in no way to, by the way, dis, dis, uh, uh, under, underestimate the, the racism of that sort of baked into the movement. You really can't um, separate out religious nationalism and, uh, and, and racism at all. And movement leaders tend to paper over the ways that hyper-conservative religion and racism often reinforce one another. So, um, you know, Doma's efforts do appear to be bearing fruit, certainly in the political arena. One of the folks who uh, attends uh, his events, uh, a fellow named Bob Branch, who uh, pastors in Temecula, so after attending one of Doman's events, he realized that by refraining from talking about politics with his congregations, he was, quote, conceding the public square to the devil. He was speaking about the abortion issue, and he told his congregation, um, and he was encouraging them to engage in anti-abortion activism. He said, every single person in this room has a sphere. And if we become God's change agents within those spheres, we're talking 150 people impacting perhaps 10,000 people, and that infection spreads. So he called it infection. Well, listen, if Mr. Branch is able to spread this infection, it's going to mint right-wing voters, because if you can get people to vote on abortion, you can control, control their vote. That's why they focus on abortion so much. In a Church United video, Pastor Rob McCoy said, the only commodity or currency in politics is winning elections. We've got to get folks in the congregations to step into this political mountain of influence. He calls it a political mountain, perhaps in a nod to a, a sort of dominionist theology, which asserts that um, there are these seven key mountains of culture, including government, law, education, uh, politics, the arts, etc., cetera. And, uh, and they should all be dominated by conservative Christians who lead like them. So, um, and I don't know if, if any of you remember Rob McCoy, he's a Thousand Oaks pastor. He fired a couple of preschool teachers back in 2015 for failing to attend church often enough at his, at his, uh, his own school, so uh, his own school, church school. So Mr. Doman and his pastors may use vague language about getting involved in issues, but there isn't the slightest doubt about whom and what they're ultimately supporting. Mr. Trump, as Doman has written, has done more for the church than many Christian presidents have. But you know, despite what they're saying at events like the Chula Vista Mega Church, it's not just about abortion. This is a really underappreciated aspect of the movement. You know, the religious right likes to pretend to be a cultural movement preoccupied with abortion or LGBT equality, but we're dealing with a political movement, not a cultural movement. It's about power. Um, and it's also to large degree about money, and I'm going to get into that soon. But I want to point out that uh, Christian nationalism did not arise out of the abortion issue. It created the abortion issue in its quest for political power. The movement is a machine, as I mentioned earlier, with many components, including religious right policy groups. I'm thinking about the Family Research Council. Um, uh, uh, you could think about uh, focus on the family, networking groups like the Council for National Policy or perhaps the family, media and legislative initiatives, legal advocacy groups like the Alliance Defending Freedom, um, the Judicial Crisis Network, Federal Society plays a role in grooming uh, candidates for judicial, right-wing judicial appointments, data organizations. What do they want? They want a lot more power for themselves and their networks and for the political leaders they support. Many look forward to a time when only Christians in their approved version of the religion 
are in charge of all major aspects of government and society. But in addition to policies that privilege their religion, they're also looking forward to a time when they can rely on government for a constant flow of taxpayer money. So to get into that, I think it's helpful to focus on the ideology of the movement leaders. Let's talk about that for a minute and go to another part of California. I learned a lot about the ideology of the movement when I visited a large uh, agricultural fair in um, the San Joaquin Valley um, in Tulare. I was there to attend the 20th anniversary celebration of Ralph Drollinger, the founder of Capital Ministries. I was there, this is his uh, invitation. This dinner that we had is very fun and interesting. I learned a lot. So he targets political leaders at the top levels of government. Drollinger has this weekly Bible study group in the Capitol. It's been attended by at least 12 current and former members of Trump's cabinet. It all sounds just unbelievable, but you know what? You can look it up online. I've written about this for the Times and others. Um, Ralph Drollinger keeps a lot of his materials up online. I think his website is capman.org. None of this is hidden. So he also has Bible study groups targeting the Senate and House of Representatives. Um, so in Tulare, Agricultural Secretary Sonny Perdue was there to give a keynote speech. Michelle Bachman was there. Uh, Congressman Jeff Denham, a number of other politicians delivered um, endorsements and little sort of, um, you know, nice little notes, uh, uh, video notes endorsing Drollinger's ministry. So he's arguably one of the most politically influential pastors in America. The expansiveness of Drollinger's positions on domestic, economic, and foreign policy hits home the fact that this is really a political movement, not just a stance in the so-called culture war. Um, Drollinger weighs in on a number of social and economic policy questions. He is firmly against progressive income taxes. And he gave a sermon uh, that he, he, I think you find it online, where he sort of argues for a flat tax, which as you know, ends up taxing uh, people who are poor uh, disproportionately. He is um, against government regulation of businesses. He's referred to environmentalism as a false religion. I thought that was pretty interesting that he's delivering that message in Tulare, which is this agricultural area, and people are dealing with the consequences of climate change, and, and he's calling uh, environmentalism or sound environmental, you know, the kind of governance that promotes sound environmental policies is referring to it as a false religion. He promotes the idea that social welfare programs have no basis in scripture. In his Bible study guides, um, you know, the government funded social welfare programs, I should say. So he teaches these things to his, the political leaders. And in one of his Bible study guides, he wrote, nowhere does God command the institutions of government or commerce to fully support those with genuine needs. Drollinger has words of wisdom for the workforce too. In a Bible study guide called Toward a Better Biblical Understanding of Lawmaking, he cites from the New Testament, the first letter of Peter 2.18, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. So, you know, it's one of these Bible passages. I'm sure different biblical scholars have interpreted it in many different ways over time. But this is what Drollinger says. He says the economy of Rome at the time of Peter's writing was one of slave and master. The principle, however, of submitting to one's boss carries over to today. I thought that was a pretty astonishing thing to write. Now, who is this going to please? Of course, the movement's plutocratic funders. You know, the movement has a lot of different sources of funding, but a lot of it comes from members of these plutocratic, uh, ex often extended families. I cover many of them in my book, the DeBoss Prince family, um, the Wilkes brothers, uh, the Green family. There are so many others many of whom rely on minimal workers' rights and economic and environmental deregulation to maintain and increase their profits. This ideology, as I explained in my book, has roots in mid-century opposition to the New Deal, and even farther back than that in pro-slavery theology. The wealthy and most powerful Southern clerics of the time, people like Robert Louis Dabney, and James Henley Thornwell promoted the idea of America as a supposedly Christian nation. 
tasked with becoming an Orthodox Christian Republic, rooted in hierarchies which they claimed were ordained by God. And they cast any of the deviation from their strict interpretation of the faith as heresy. Now, of course, at the time, you also had abolitionist theologians. I wrote about a dozen of them in my book. I wrote about the conflict between the abolitionist theologians and the pro-slavery theologians. But I did pull this quote because I think it's really germane. So you hear echoes in, in what you're hearing today from leaders of the religious right. So Thornwell, this, he was Dabney's brother in arms in the Southern Presbyterian Church, is a defender of slavery, as was... Um, Dabney, he writes, the parties in this conflict are not merely abolitionists and slaveholders. So these two sides, right? He says, they're atheists, socialists, communists, red Republicans on the one side, he's thinking that's the abolitionists, right? The atheists, socialists, communists, and the, the friends of order and regulated freedom on the other. He's associating order and <laughs> and regulated freedom with slaveholders and slavery. So it's pretty disgusting. But you can find some of these ideas echoing in the writings and statements of movement leaders today, including David Barton. He is a historical revisionist who I call the Where's Waldo of the movement because he sits on the boards of so many of its initiatives. I mean, he's just everywhere. Um, Barton, he's a sort of... Um, He's written a lot of books about, you know, sort of his view of Americans, you know, um, biblical founding and, you know, says that um, God and the Bible oppose, like, like Drollinger, he says they, uh, God and the Bible oppose progressive income taxes, capital gains taxes, and minimum wage laws. And he exploits, so he's got a lot of economic theory in his, um, in his writings. He's actually said at one point, I'm going to sort of, um, butcher the quote a bit because I don't have it in front of me. He said something like, if I want to know if a politician is going to take good care of, of money, if they're going to have good economic policy, I see how they're going to vote on abortion. Because over time, leaders of the movement have been able to sort of uh, like um, bind the issue of abortion to libertarian sort of uh, economic policy. So he wrote this essay called The Bible, Slavery, and America's Founders, and he writes, different forms of slavery have replaced the more obvious system of the past century. And he wrote, the state has assumed the role of master for many, providing aid and assistance, and with it more and more control to those unable to provide for themselves. The only solution to slavery, Barton wrote, is the liberty of the gospel. I mean, if this sounds offensive to you, it's because it is. First, he seems to be attempting to deracialize and whitewash, as it were, the explicitly racist institution of slavery in America, which is just so wrong and incredibly offensive. He's actually trying to cast a social safety net, things like job training and health care and food assistance um, uh, from the government as a form of slavery. It's just wrong on so many levels. And by the way, if, if that actually comes these ideas come from a mid-century theologian named Rusas John Rushduni, who was a segregation apologist, uh, very wild, wildly influential, and whose ideas kind of echo also in a lot of the uh, writings of some of the movement leaders today. But well, um, he also called, by the way, um, government assistance to the poor and the needy, like slavery to the state. But while movement leaders oppose what they call government handouts to the poor, they have no problem at all with government handouts and other free goodies to conservative religious organizations. The movement has learned to siphon public money through subsidies, tax deductions, very unique to tax deductions that other non-religious nonprofits don't have other benefits. They don't have to open up their books like other non-religious nonprofits. Um, grants, vouchers, and other schemes. So religions are treated really differently in our tax code and in our legal code with the understanding that they steer clear of partisan politics. Um, the role of public money is huge. The calls for religious freedom that characterize much of the activism of religious nationalists today, though undoubtedly bound up in a sincerely held belief that conservative Christians should be able to discriminate against LGBT Americans and others, 
they're as loud and passionate as they are because um, activists have their eyes trained. I'm so sorry, I just got distracted. Um, is every can everybody hear okay? Yeah, I, I found them mute. I, I muted them. You're good, okay. Catherine. Sorry about that. All right. Well, we were talking about money and how um, uh, the religious right is really trying to increase the flow of public money to their groups in ways that allow them to continue to discriminate and proselytize on the taxpayer dime, all in the name of so called religious liberty. And by the way, you guys probably have read about this, but the government is now allowing federal pandemic aid to play, pay clergy salaries. This is a direct payment of our tax dollars to fund religion, something that would have been unthinkable in a previous era and would have caused a lot more uh, of an uproar. I want to focus very quickly on another aspect of the machine, the Christian nationalist machine, by focusing on one of the movements data organizations that turns out the vote. It's called United in Purpose. United in Purpose uses, has used psychological profiling to target um, voters to turn out for right-wing Republican candidates. It, it identifies a lot of these uh, voters or has done through conservative church membership lists, membership in organizations opposing marriage equality and abortion and other means. Its founder, Bill Dallas, has not been shy in describing the massive reach of his data operation. In a 2016 interview, he said, well, with David Brody, um, I believe it was David Brody, the Christian Broadcasting Network, he said, we have about 200 million files, meaning 200 million voter files. So we have pretty much the whole voting population in our database. What we do is we track to see what's going to make somebody either vote one way or not vote at all. Think about it. What we do is track to see what's going to make someone either vote one way or not vote at all. So this is a, an initiative that was incredibly important in turning out the vote um, for, uh, for Trump. Um, and this initiative, too, has its uh, roots here in California. They would say for the biblical values, not so much for Trump. But, you know, it's the biblical values are, you know, for the, uh, you know, the champion of religious nationalism was Trump. So the initiative has its roots in California too, more precisely in the San Quentin State Prison, which is where Bill Dallas, who I quoted earlier, founder of United in Purpose, he's um, a former model and real estate developer. He spent several years at San Quentin State Prison for various financial crimes before founding, leaving prison, having a sort of religious awakening in prison, founding the organization and his working, working his way into the heart of the Christian nationalist voter turnout machine. His is a really wild story. I mean, he's just a fascinating character and I do urge everybody here to read my book, The Power Worshippers, get all the crazy details. I think somebody needs to make a movie out of that guy. United in Purpose has a number of initiatives that I describe in my book, but we don't have a lot of time here. So I wanna just look at one of them. Um, it's called Project 75. It's a tool for pastors that helps them turn out their congregations to vote. Um, and they feature something called a lookup tool. They sort of help pastors see what congregations, what percentage of their congregations turned out to vote and what actually, which ones voted in the last election. Now, of course, all um, political parties of all persuasions use data to turn out elections, but most of, you know, it, on the religious right, it's all, I mean, on the right, it's all operating the top of a pyramid. Um, almost all, like it's operating in the faith-based space. So that means it's exempt from taxes and shielded from public scrutiny. So I wanna sort of sum up, um, get to the close of the talk. Um, the rise of this movement should alarm us, but it shouldn't be the cause of despair. Overcoming this kind of reactionary and authoritarian movement isn't just something Americans can do. It has made Americans what we are. We're seeing a lot more political engagement today than we saw even a couple of years ago. But you simply can't affect political change without winning elections. There is no substitute for the power of the vote. We can't allow ourselves to be comforted by polls. I think a mistake people make on this topic is they assume the majority rules in a country like the United States. Guess what? It doesn't. 40 to 50% of people don't vote, and an additional number are disenfranchised 
through race-based gerrymandering and voter suppression and other means. And in that situation, you really don't need a majority to win elections. You just need a committed minority to access the levers of power. But that, you know, goes both ways. So, you know, we don't need to just vote ourselves. We need to make sure everyone can vote, you know, f do what one can to vote, b fight for their right to vote and against gerrymandering, voter suppression, um, uh, and, uh, and hold others accountable in your circle to vote. I think there are, there are things we can do as individuals on the voting level, holding people in our circle accountable, and there are things we can do only if we join together. The right has invested in all the tools of modern political campaign infrastructure, data and media and messaging. Those tools are available to all of us who oppose the politics of conquest and division that this movement represents and who defend the separation of church and state, a principle upon which our freedoms absolutely depend. Religious nationalists are using the tools of democratic political culture to end democracy. Those same resources can be used to restore it. Thanks very much.